All right, good morning. Well, we are stuck here. All right, so today we are talking about the pre trib rapture. We've laid the foundation of what the other views of the rapture are. We've dis discounted the, uh, the idea that of a post raft I mean, a post-tribulation rapture, and the reason why we said that is because, you know, we got counting problems and population problems and all sorts of other issues. And all that stuff's on the training in the previous lessons if you missed it. Uh, just get onto the YouTube page, and, uh, and that's always in the link. So go back to session 10 and 11. That's, that lays a good foundation for what we're going to talk about. Uh, Pre-trib rapture, as I explained... Um, I, I sit about 90 to 95 percent in this camp, and we're probably going to actually end up spending two, three weeks on this as I looked at everything I had, and I had to lay some foundation. So today is a foundation, and we're only going to examine two of the reasons why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. But before that, um, this was a very interesting article I came across. <laughs> Yes, it is. Um, game-changing oil reserves found. Now, here's why it's game-changing. First of all, it's in the Golan Heights. It's uh, on the border of Syria. The strata in which the oil resides is 300 meters thick, where a normal strata is usually only 30, 35 meters thick. So it's 10 times more dense than anything else in the world or most of the things that they encounter. Um, and it can make... Israel is self-sufficient for decades. Well, we've talked about this, the building events, with Russia now and Syria and Iran. We've worked our way up into the stages, but now we add another building event, oil discovered. And we see in Ezekiel 38, verse 13, uh, Sheba and the Dan, which is what we know as Saudi Arabia, and the merchants of Tarshish, which is what we believe are basically the European Union, they ask Russia and its Islamic allies, why are you doing this? Are you coming to, stay, to take what is not yours? And now we see that it has been speculated, uh, and I tell you, I've been following prophecy for 30, 40 years, well, 30 years, and David can probably tell you, because uh, he's been following prophecy a long time too, and those of you who have been following, I mean, seriously, students of prophecy and actually reading people's analysis and research, they can tell you, they'll tell you, uh, and I'll tell you, for decades it has been speculated that what the, the spoil is is oil. That it's, there's some oil somewhere in Israel or natural gas reserves or something that just hadn't been discovered yet. And that that's what it is. Uh, Gold in my ear was real famous for saying Moses wandered the desert for 40 years and settled in the one place in the Middle East that didn't have oil. Um, like, thanks a lot, Moses. You could have taken, you could have stopped in Saudi Arabia, but... Uh, they have now found it. Uh, there is also rumors that there is a, a tremendous natural gas reserve in the eastern Mediterranean off the coast of Israel. So when you look at, uh, at Putin, Putin on the Ritz. <laughs> so you latecomers missed that, and y'all really missed something funny. Um, when we look at why Putin is in Israel, actually in Syria, why why Iran and why Russia are really trying to post their influence in that part of the world. It's not humanitarian. Remember, they, they're, not, they're not being humanitarian. They're supporting a regime, of course. But there may be some other issues. And if, for those of you who know what's going on in Crimea and uh, the Ukraine, one of the big political, geopolitical influences there is the natural gas pipelines that come through there and go to Europe. I think Europe gets 40, 50 percent of all their natural gas from that area. And that's the reason why Russia wants control of it, because they can control the influx of, of you know, natural gas into all of Europe and really impact the, the prices at the pump and electricity and everything else. Well, now they have found huge oil reserves right on the border of Syria. That's where the Golan Heights is. It's right on the border. I mean, could have been somewhere else. It could have been out. No, it had to be right on the border of one of the most contested pieces of land in the world. We forget about the Golan Heights and how contested it is because they've made some agreements in the last 20, 30 years that have kind of ceded that area 
you know, to Syria, but they still own control of it, and there's still problems with Hezbollah on the Golan Heights. So this is real interesting. Is it another piece of the puzzle? I don't know. But uh, as I've always said, prophecy, figuring out any particular prophecy is looking at a jigsaw puzzle. And, and you put pieces together. You have all these pieces, and you know that that may be a hand or that's an eye, but you don't know where it fits. And unfortunately, it's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together without the box. Just a bunch of pieces on the table. And, and you can eventually do it, but it takes a while. And sometimes God puts those pieces in clumps together and helps you along. And that's what I think is happening here. So I wanted to talk briefly about that because it's, it's another example of what's going on in the building events. And I talked about this last Sunday night to our Sunday night class. And I told them, you know, it's so interesting because this literally changes weekly. These little stepping stones are popping up out of the water. They're these little rungs on the ladder to this global fight here in Israel. It's, we don't know how this will happen. And there are still some pieces in here. One of them is right now, Turkey... Uh, is is butting heads with Russia. They're wanting to, we're taking our Patriot missile batteries out. They don't want that. They need to defend. They've act, they, they said a couple of days ago that they had shot down a Russian plane, which was probably bluster. It probably did not happen, but it's Turkey saying that. So there's some conflict there. So the question I have is how do they come into this? They're in this confederacy. So something has to happen that causes Turkey to change sides and to join these guys, because right now they're fighting against them over ISIS, because the Turks don't like the Kurds. And basically conned us a month or two ago into bombing the Kurds. Uh, if you watch World News, you know what I'm talking about. We got over there and you know flew, got some planes flying out of Turkey to to drop some bombs on ISIS, and it turned out we dropped bombs on the Kurds and attacked them. They used us to attack the Kurds, which is not what we were there for. So there's some things going on here. We don't know all these pieces of the puzzle. Okay, so that being said, we got to move on. So this is where we're, where we're focusing our efforts now. We've talked about the pre-wrath. I'm about 5-10% in this camp. And we're going to look at some reasons why I'm here, uh, but mostly here. And today we're going to lay the foundation of why I'm almost positive we're here. But like I said, it's only about 90% positive. And we discounted this for the reasons we've talked about. So, hopefully you did your homework. And if not, uh, we will still read some of these verses. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Now get prepared. I hope everybody came ready to do some math. Everybody ready to do math? Remember, that was one of the problems with the post-trib rapture view is you had a math problem. Okay? If you can count, it's not post-trib rapture because Jesus is coming is no surprise. If you can count to 1260. Now, we could have a possible theory where Vanessa counts days different than I do. Okay? So, if I say how many days away is Thursday? We're going to go on we're going to go on a big trip on Thursday. How many days till our big trip? This Thursday. This coming Thursday. <coughs> three. Vanessa would say three. I would say four. No, no, no. We're talking a trip to Dallas or whatever. If we go on a trip. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Because she would not count today and she would not count Thursday. She would not count Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So for three days, that's her three days, where I would count Sunday to Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday, to Thursday. Four literal days. We got, you know, 96 hours. So say do it in hours if you're okay. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> so this has always been a running joke in our marriage for, for 18 years about the only two days to our trip. I'm like, no, it's three. I mean, it happens all the time. So depending on how you count, if you include a day or not, uh, 1260 days from the abomination of desolation, we know we come to the, you know, the second coming. It's 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. So if you can do simple math, 
You know that Jesus is coming, you know, when, when the Antichrist declares himself God, and you can count to 1260, you know the day Jesus is coming back. It's in the Bible. It's in Daniel. So that, to me, how can Jesus say, I come as a thief in a knife, and it's gonna, a night, I'm going to come in an hour, you think not, when, well, it's on a Tuesday, and, you know, <clears throat> he'd make himself a liar in his word. So Daniel 9.24 says 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. So who is, this is Daniel being told this. He, uh, the angel is telling Daniel this. Who is Daniel's people in context? Israel. It's Israel. All right? Thy people. And people specifically, the Hebrew word means specifically a tribe or a nation. Uh, people who believe in the post-trib rapture or discount this will say that because Romans 11 says we've been grafted in, that we are now part of the nation of Israel. We are not part of the, we're part of the spiritual nation of Israel, but not the physical people. So that is a, I always like to keep my options open uh, on things that aren't written in stone. When, okay, for instance, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. That is set in stone. There are no options you can go to. Because no man means no man. You have some gray areas here that we could say, well, maybe it's spiritual. But I don't think God does that. Because uh, I, I don't think he's going to reveal the church. Because that's what he would be doing. He's revealing the church age. And I don't think that that's what, this is what this is about. Also, the holy city. The church age has nothing to do with Jerusalem. It's not, I mean, we all we do as Christians call Jerusalem holy, but so do Muslims, and so do Jews. And I think it's, it's very interesting that that is the pivot point of all of history. The pivot point. Everything pretty much that's been done in the last 2,000 years, is somebody, if you, if you take a chain, you can go back to Jerusalem somehow. Even stuff that happened in Europe. Uh, can be traced through the, what, what the Roman church was doing. And you can go back to Jerusalem. It's the pivot point of all history. And for those, some of you may know, languages. If you are west of Jerusalem, you basically read from left to right. And if you're right of Jerusalem, you basically read from right to left. Now, there are some exceptions, but by and large, you read from right to left. Arabic, right to left. Chinese, right, you know, you're reversed. Because everything focuses on Jerusalem. What, what are we doing here? We're, we're finishing the transgression. Now, to put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both the vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. So those are the things that the 70 weeks are for. Okay, to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity. Now, what do these sound like? What does that sound like? What event in history did this? The cross. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Did the cross bring in everlasting righteousness? I mean, and did the world become righteous at that time? No. So it's to seal both the vision and the prophet. Were there prophets after the cross? Apostle Paul wasn't a prophet? Okay. John? He's writing 65 years after the cross. So they obviously did not take that. And to anoint a most holy place. Was a most holy place anointed after the cross? No. I'll answer your question. No, it wasn't. Because the holy place was destroyed after the cross. Okay? That, they, if it's anointing, then it got anointed by a Roman legion. So, verses 25 and 26. Understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. And we're going to talk about what these weeks are. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. And after 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. So what does that mean? Daniel said, the week. what's a week? David, Lee, uh, David Reed, you can't answer. Because you, know you know all these answers. What's a week? It's a year. Seven years. Period of seven years. Uh, Shabula. It literally means seven. Seven. 
And, and according to how the Hebrew is translated, uh, and, and from all the chicken scraps, that, you know, the little tittles and the yolks and all that stuff around it, we know from people who are actually Hebrew scholars, of which I am not. I'm not a Greek scholar either. I uh, would never want that for my life because I think it would be insanity and too much study. So, seven. It's a period of seven years. One week is a period of seven years. Now, we have three different time periods mentioned here. One is a period of seven years. Another is a period of 62. I'm sorry, seven sevens. Seven weeks. A week is a seven-year period. So we have seven of these weeks. So that's 49 years. Then we have 62 of these weeks. All right? That's 434 years, I think. And then we have another period of one week, one period of seven years. So totally, totaled up, that's 70. So what's a Hebrew year? How many days are in a Hebrew year? When we talk prophetically. All right, David Green. How many days in a Hebrew year? In a Hebrew year. No. That's three and a half Hebrew years. Oh, okay. Yeah. How many days... 360 days. Okay, there are 360 days in a Hebrew year. They add every fifth or sixth year, depending on the moon, solar cycles, I mean the lunar cycles, they'll add an extra 13th month to catch themselves. Kind of like a leap year, but except they have leap months. So, a Hebrew year, when we look into scripture, is not 365 days. It's 360 days. That is the reason why 1,260 days equals exactly 42 months. Whereas if you were to divide uh, 1,260 days by 365, you would not get three and a half years. You would get something a little bit off of that. So it's 360 days. So our first period, 49 years, that's 17,640 days. Second period, that's another 62 weeks. That's 434 years, or 156,240 days. And then we have this final week, which is seven years, 2,520 days. Okay? And if you half that at a midpoint of a 70 week, in the middle of the week, and we'll look at that scripture, in the middle of the week, they get 1,260 days, which is what we said happens. Uh, Christ comes 1,260 days at the midpoint of the tribulation period, of the seven-year period. So, for total, for the 69 weeks, and this is actually getting somewhere, and you guys will be able to see it when I put some illustration on it here. 483 years, 69 weeks, or 173,880 days. This is an extremely important number. I know you're probably thinking it's not. Or why is it? Well, I'm about to show you why it is. So, period one begins with the decree to rebuild the walls. And that was decreed by Artaxerxes on March 14th, 445 B.C., and we know that in Nehemiah 2. Remember, what, what is the premise of this class? One of the premises, that everything in the, in the Bible is important. Everything. You may not know it. That's why we call it verbal plenary inspiration. Verbal means it came from God. Plenary means, plenary means Andrew? Months. Okay. Means everything yeah. is important. So the Bible is made up of God's word and every word is inspired. Even the little bitty things in Nehemiah 2 that we don't even look at, it means something. And in this particular instant, it means it, it plays into Daniel's 70th week because this was a prophecy by Daniel. Okay? This, Daniel is saying... The, the 70 week period begins at the decree. He did, some dude in the future, some king in the future is going to decree and say, go ahead. And we know that Artaxerxes Longimanus was his name, told Nehemiah, why is your face all sad? Well, because I'm thinking about my, you know, he goes, go. All right? Completion of Jerusalem took 49 years to do this. And then period two, the end of that 69 weeks, because remember, we have seven years, or, or 49 years, so, so a period of seven sevens, and then we had a period of 62 sevens. So they rebuilt, started the building, and then they, they finished. And then we had a long period of 434 years until something happened. 
And that is when the anointed one is cut off. So, if you count 173,880 days from, from March 14th, 445 B.C., you get to April 6th, 32 A.D. Anybody know what happened on that day? You're close. It was Palm Sunday. That was the day that the anointed one came in and declared himself king and was cut off by his people. This is the reason why the book of Daniel is the most contested book in the Bible. Because people who do not believe in the word of God can't figure out how it can possibly have been written in the 6th century B.C. They have said, oh, it can't be written in because it has all these accurate predictions of the kingdom of Greece and, and, and what's going to happen with the Roman Empire. So it can't be. It just can't be. Some of them even go as far to say that it was written in the 1st century A.D., which we know is an absolute impossibility because it appears in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation, and we know that dates to the 3rd century B.C. That's the reason why this is the most hated book, the most... If you go look on Wikipedia, you will see that there's all sorts of theories about when it's written, but we know it was written by a man named Daniel in the 6th century B.C., and that is the most accurate prophecy in the Bible. <clears throat> right there. Because if you count 173,880 days from that date... You come to that date, and that is the day Jesus declared himself king. That's a pretty accurate prophecy. And then he's cut off. That's Palm Sunday. Cut off. Now, the word cut off there in the Hebrew, it literally means the death sentence of a criminal. That's interesting. Because if you read it in the English, remember what I said? we got to get into the Greek sometimes, or the Hebrew. you got to get into the original language. Because if you say cut off... If I say cut off to you, that means, hey, I'm cutting them off. All right, that means I'm just not going to talk to them anymore. That's our context. That's our culture. In the Hebrew, it means a death sentence of a criminal. So in other words, they're going to treat the anointed one as a criminal and sentence him to death and kill him. that mean a little bit more now? So, 70 weeks to finish the transgression. Also, literally means to finish the rebellion. What is sin? It's rebellion against God. And what did Jesus say on the cross? What were his last words? It is finished. Into, my hand, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It's finished. Tetelestai in the Greek. And tetelestai in the Greek, literally means ain't nothing else coming after. It's not like the end of a movie because you can stay for a double feature. It's the end, period. Done. Finish. To put an end to sin. The condition of sin. To atone for iniquity. And that's what Jesus did. He atoned. So, all of this takes place in the first 69 weeks. At the end of the 69th week. Now, we still have a, 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 dang, a, a, a dangling chad out there, right? A hanging chad. It's that 70th week. To bring in everlasting righteousness. That's the millennial kingdom. That happens at the end of the 70th week. So these, what's interesting is these first three things happen in end of the 69th week. And these last three things happen at the end of the 70th week. And notice they're in order. A casual reader of the, of the book of Daniel or maybe even a scholarly reading of the book of Daniel prior to the cross would have seen all of these together because that's what the Jews did, right? They lumped the comings together. First and second coming were together. They didn't see that there was a 2,000 plus year separation. But there is. But Daniel, through the inspiration of God, put them in order. Now, it would mean a whole lot less if this one was up here and this one's down here and they were jumbled. But it's in perfect order. Because when he, when he said it's finished, the condition of sin was put a, done and the atonement was made with his death. And then, 
He brings in everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and profit. If this doesn't happen until the 70th week, we need to remember that cessationist argument that some Baptists are known to have and other people are known to have, that the gifts, especially the gifts of prophecy, the gift of knowledge, the gift of tongues and those things, because they say what that which is perfect shall come is the Scripture, even though you, you have to guess that that's what the Scripture is talking about. Because, and now I'm talking out of 1 Corinthians 13, because we can't, have, we can't prove that that which is perfect is the Scripture. However, Daniel says here, uh, to seal both vision and prophet. That's when they're sealed, not until the end of the 70th week. And we also know in Revelation 11, we have two witnesses that are prophesying. So if you call something to cease, which is what people say, the secessionists will say those gifts ceased. That word in the Greek, ceased, means it can never, it's like to tell us that. It can't be undone. So how are two prophets prophesying if something has ceased to happen at the canon of Scripture? Or when John basically said the end in the book of uh, Revelation in 95 AD. If those cease at that point, then none of this can happen. Y'all following me? Okay. So that's the important, that's, that's the reason why we have to look at Scripture as a whole. And I remember when I came across that idea that, wait, I was reading Revelation, it's about 20 years ago, and I'm like, well, how can the gifts cease if I've got two prophets prophesying? How can that happen? So it must mean something else. Yeah. Am I misunderstanding, or I, I've got a question. If the mm -hmm. gifts cease, then how is the book of Revelation written? They say it ceased the at, the begin, at the end of the, uh, when John okay. said the end. I just want to make yeah, sure. With, or, or with the canon of Scripture, it ceased. And, but like I said, the, prob the problem with that is that you have to assume that that which is perfect shall come is the Scripture. Because that's what the Scripture... Uh, can somebody look it up for me? It's 1 Corinthians 13, uh, like is it 10, 8, 10? It's in the love chapter. For I know in part, I, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm looking through a glass dimly. It's that whole section there. And we're... 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love chapter. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It should be down in verse 10. Uh, 12? Yeah. We're definitely not getting it. We're going to be, we're going to spend oh, it. yeah. So, for we know the part of the cross line part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Okay, so does anybody? 9 and 10. Okay, 9 and 10? Yeah. Okay, so does anybody hear the word Holy Scripture in there? No. Do you, do you know from the context of the passage even, or from the Greek that's used, what that which is perfect is actually talked for? So we have to make assumptions, am I correct? And when we make assumptions that it's the Scripture, we have to back it up. If something's not written out, spelled out, we're going to have to then find clues at what it means. And so my whole point here is that if prophecies and the prophets aren't sealed until after the end of the 70th week, then that means prophesying can't be sealed at the, at the first century A.D. Okay? It just can't. And there's also that problem of uh, Joel chapter 2. In the latter days, now I know Peter quoted it, but he didn't quote the whole thing, and it, it, in the latter days... Your old man will dream dreams. Your young man will have visions. That's prophesying. That is foretelling the future. And that's in the latter day. And if that's sealed, how, how, how can it, it just can't happen. So we have to put, these are pieces of the puzzle. This is how we studied the Bible. When something's not spelled out, we've got to go find clues to help figure out. Now, to me, what I believe that which is perfect shall come is the second coming of Christ and the establishment of the millennial kingdom. Because at that point, all of that, there is no need for prophesying anymore. There absolutely is no need. And all of you have heard stories, and probably some of you have experienced this. Um, you know what? Don't do this because bad things could happen. You, it's a feeling you get. You get a bad feeling. It's the Holy Spirit telling you not to do something. I was in an accident when I was 14 years old, driving with a friend, coming home from a football game. And my mom knew I was going to be an accident. And for the whole time I was gone, she was in praying on her knees. Lord had revealed to her, lift yourself up in prayer. He's going to be in an accident. And sure enough, we hit a deer, and I was in an accident. 
we hit a culvert going 53 miles an hour. I didn't have a seatbelt on. It was 1982. We hit a culvert because uh, the guy swerved to miss the deer. We got into a deep ditch, hit the culvert. The speedometer stuck at 53 miles an hour. I didn't have a seatbelt on, and I did not go anywhere. I didn't fly into You go from 53 miles an hour to dead stop and see what happens to your body. I had no, I, I, I hit my knee on the console. That was it. Nothing happened to me. I was literally held into place. Now, that was a future event that the Lord revealed to my mom. Granted, it was only three hours in the future, but that's what prophecy is. is a foretelling. It's also forth telling of the Word of God. But it's also foretelling of future events. And if that which is perfect was the Holy Scripture and prophecies and knowledge, words of knowledge and stuff like that ceased, then my mom should not have had that experience. But she did. Because I remember I walked in the door. I'm buying some time here because I'm not going to be able to get to the, the big thing here. I walked in the door and my dad said, hey, how'd the game go? I'm like, well, it went okay. We won, but we were in a bad accident. Because he totaled his formula. He had one of those brand new formulas. And he absolutely totaled it. I, I still remember the deer's head appearing briefly. It was like a 10-pointer. It was a good buck. Um, <laughs> And it had been raining, and he swerved. 18-year-old kid, 17-year-old kid, you know. I would have done the same thing probably at 46. He swerved and got down in that ditch. So I told my dad, I said, we were in an accident. He goes, what do you mean? And uh, Dwayne said, we hit a deer, and my car is totaled. We got into the ditch and, and wrecked out in a culvert, and my car is absolutely totaled. We hit a culvert that was about the size of this. There was two, two big tubes, concrete tubes, and we hit it. Boom going 53 miles an hour. And he went, oh, Lord. And I'm like, well, we're okay. He goes, no, that ain't it. I'm like, well, thanks, Dad. <laughs> uh, he said, your mom has been in there crying for the last three and a half hours that God would spare your life. Because she told me that this was going to happen. And I've been spending the last three and a half hours telling her to get off the floor that, er that, that you're being stupid. My mom heard that, I guess heard the door and had walked around our house because her bedroom and she'd walked around the house. She walked in about 10 seconds after dad had told me that. And she walked in, she had a big smile on her face. She said, thank you, Lord. I see you're okay. And she, she didn't know, but she knew so much so that I was going to be in that accident that she didn't even see it. Come to me and go, were y'all in an accident? Is everything okay? She, she said, I see. I think she said something. I see you're okay. God spared you. And I'm like, and of course my friend is like, <laughs> wow, yeah. So that's we, we 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 have to understand these parts. We have to learn to piece scripture together. So the last week is for thy people. Who are thy people? Israel. Romans 11.25. All this fits together. It's amazing. You can you, you go all over the Old Testament and New Testament and you put these pieces together. At least you be wise in your own sight. Now, who's, who's Paul talking to here? Church at Rome. He's church at Rome, and they're primarily a bunch of Gentile believers. There are some Jews there, but most of them are Gentile believers. And he, he's through this whole 10th and 11th chapter, he is talking about the fact that the Gentiles have been grafted in to the trunk that is that is Israel, and he doesn't want them to get cocky about it. Now, I can tell you right now, that is a big problem in Christianity because there are whole denominations who believe that the promise of Abraham and, and what we studied in Genesis chapter 12, that that's been, that somehow that unconditional covenant, which is what it was, because we know that unconditional there's conditional covenants and unconditional covenants. Unconditional covenant is, I don't care what you do, I'm following through. Here's an unconditional covenant for, now, granted, there are some wackadoodles in this world. But for everybody in this room, you have a conditional, an unconditional covenant with your children. No matter what they do, no matter how much trouble they get into, and no matter how bad they treat you, you still love them. That's an unconditional covenant. 
Conditional covenants are what we may have with some family members and friends. I will love you and cherish you, but if you do me wrong enough, I'm cutting you off. Not in the Old Testament context, but in our context. Okay. Now, some people in the Old Testament way. So, context. Don't be wise in your own eyes. In other words, don't think you've got something that's so special and that you're one up on the Jews and everything's great. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. What's mystery? Huh? Okay. Remember the Greek word is mysterion. What does it mean? It's a mystery. What is? But tell me what a mystery is. It's an unknown. If I reveal a mystery to you, this is something that has never been revealed before. Not even in Scripture. So if I tell you a mystery, when Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's a mystery. That is a previously undetermined, unknown thing. Hence the reason why the rapture has to be different than the second coming. Because the second coming of Christ was revealed throughout all of the Old Testament. Paul could not use the word mystery or mysterion if he was talking about the second coming being the rapture. Because that ain't no mystery. The resurrection of the dead is no mystery. The mystery has to be that there's two separate events. So that's one reason why we know, we recall, that post-trib rapture cannot be the way it is. It just can't be. Because it's not a mystery. And there's a lot of other reasons too. A partial hardening. Notice partial. I, I know some Messianic Jews. Okay? So it's not a total hardening. It's a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, the Gentiles, what this means is that the Gentiles have had their full time of the church age all, church age all to themselves. So in other words, there's this partial hardening. God has calloused their eyes. He's blinded them. He's got, right, he's got scales. That's the reason why when Paul came to Christ, why do you think scales fell from his eyes? It's symbolic. But what happens to all Jews? It's they, they're, they're blinded. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, we, we have a, a fullness of the Gentiles. In other words, they are running the church age, but not forever. There is a number. Now, it doesn't mean that Gentiles won't get saved afterwards. Well, we know through Revelation that that's, that's going to happen because it says that there's martyrs during this period from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Any Greek word that could possibly be used to denote a different type of people or a different race is used. If whether you're American or whether you're uh, Scott Irish or, or whatever, there, there's those different Greek words are used to show that there's, there's a mix, there's, there's a potpourri of people that are killed for the cause of Christ in the tribulation. Um, so the, the fullness, at some point, there's a, there's a countdown number. And we don't know what that number is. So at some point, that clock runs out. And then we get into the last week. And that is for thy people. They have to do this. We don't do it. And if it's seven years... How can we do it uh, if we're here? Because the Jews aren't just going to all of a sudden take over every church in the country. Uh, every, you know, the Billy Graham Association. Okay? They're, they're not, how can they do that? Yeah, they could come join us if we're here. But there has to be, in order, in other, in order for this to occur, there has to be a vacuum to be built. So that they're now believers. And I believe that's the rapture of the church. So, because we see in Revelation 7, 4, the number of the seal was 144,000 from every tribe. There's that word. Remember what the word, the, the people, it's another word for basically tribe. For every tribe of the sons of Israel. And we'll look at that at a future day. So during the last seven years, the Jew will be in charge of spreading the gospel message, not the Gentile. You're going to have 144,000 Billy Grahams Set loose. This is the JW theory. That got pretty much debunked. Oh. What, yeah, the, the Jehovah's Witness theory was that uh, 
the 144,000 were Jehovah's Witnesses. And that the end of the world would come once their church membership had 144,000 because that would be the ceiling of the last, you know, the 144,000. And then when they grew past that, you had to, they kind of had to change some things. It got quiet. They got quiet, heard some crickets, and then they said, oh, it's spiritual. Uh, there's 144,000 that are going to be like super Jehovah's Witnesses. And once we get 144,000 super duper Jehovah's Witnesses, because not everybody's a super duper, right? Some people are just super, and some people are duper, but not everybody's super duper. So, yeah, exactly. And so I'm going to close it with this. this. We're now getting into the things that are going to take place hereafter. All right, and this is where we're going to stop, uh, and I'll pick it up next week because I don't want to. I don't want to rush it. I want to talk about this for a few minutes. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me, like a trumpet. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. The, the voice talks like a trumpet, and it said, "Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this." So, remember we had our, our things before, Revelation 1, the things that are, Revelation 2 and 3, the things that are hereafter, Revelation 4 and on. So, this is future event. And we see that for the future event, we have, what's, Revelation 2 and 3 are addressing who? The, church. the churches. All right? What's interesting is the church is never mentioned again after chapter 3. You never see the word church again. It is absent. Yeah, you never see the word church again. You never see the church again. You would think for, for the Lord who spent so much time in the first three chapters talking about the church, the lampstands and this church and that church and hear what the Spirit says to the churches and all these things. And now for the remaining 18 chapters, crickets. And it happens after he is told to come up here. Nelson, you don't think that 7 9 is speaking for the church? No. No, we'll, we'll get into that. So we see uh, that the voice talks like a trumpet, and he is told to come up here. Now, there's another place where this word is used, this Greek phrase, come up here, and that is in Revelation 11. And I'll get to that. Uh, So the voice is like a trumpet. Now, I think this is an illusion because in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, we know that this is talking about the rapture. The timing is, is, is debatable, okay? But we know it's the rapture. It's the, the trans, you know, translation of, of mortal into immortality. And we find that, I find it interesting that both times it uses trumpet. Trumpets are here. The trump of the Lord, you know, uh, Having the angel have a trumpet, and yet we hear a voice like a trumpet saying, "Come up here." So, and then we don't see the church again. So, is this hardcore proof? No. Does it make really good circumstantial evidence? Yes. All right. Come up here is also used in Revelation eleven to twelve. And you know what, who, who, who's, who are our, we just talked about them about five, ten minutes ago. There's a couple of guys in Revelation 11. Who are they? The two prophets. And how long do they prophesy for? Three and a half years. They are given the Antichrist all kinds of mess. And then they kill them. They finally are able to kill these guys. And how long do they lay, they lay their, their dead bodies? Three and a half days. Now what's interesting is, is that it says that people of every tribe, and we'll talk about this, I'm going to get ahead a little bit. Every tribe in the world are sending presents to each other. Like, thank the Lord. You know, and I'll probably not thank, thank the Lord, the guy sitting, you know, they, they finally took care of these two guys. Now, this was a prophecy that was not possible up until the last century. Because there is no way 500 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, maybe 50, 
60, but since the 50s, that you could have people watching the, de the prophets laying dead in the street from every tribe at the same time. It wasn't until the invention of satellite television, satellites carrying live signals, or back in the day they had big cables that went across the Atlantic. It wasn't until those days that you could actually watch. You could have heard it on a radio 50 years before, but you not until those days. And now, if anything happens in the world, we see it on CNN and Fox and MSNBC and ABC, CBA, you know, on our phones. So we see that that was a prophecy. And after they are, they are dead, they are resurrected. And the words that are used with their resurrection are come up here. And it's the only two places in the whole scripture that that phrase is used, come up here. And it means basically they're translated to heaven. So some more circumstantial evidence. So what are our questions? I got one need to clarify. Okay. Uh, you said after chapter 4, well, it says in Thessalonians, and so shall be always one with the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And we're going to talk about 1 Thessalonians next week. If you look around about the throne where Jesus is at, it says you got the 20. Ah, that, 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 that is the that is next week because see there you go that's what I didn't get to this week we're talking about the 24 elders next week and the four beasts we'll talk about the four beasts in a couple of weeks but we're talking about the 24 elders are next week so if you don't know what we're talking about you need to read Revelation 4 uh, for, and I, I'll have to admit I had a really easy time preparing this lesson because I wrote a thesis for partial fulfillment of my, my master's on the 24 elders. And all I did was go back into my stack of stuff and open that file. And I had remember, I, re, I, was, I had forgotten so much of what I wrote. But I went through that. That's what I did yesterday. Was I actually went down and reread my thesis. So I actually did a thesis on the 24 elders. And I'm going to spare you guys most of it <laughs> about 95 percent of it all right but the 24 elders there's a sneak preview they do represent the church and there are reasons that i've got on this powerpoint already that are that show why they are the church so hang on to that you i'll answer that question next week Elsie, yes sir in the notes here it says come up here is understood by some interpreters to speak of the rapture of the church in the middle of the tribulation Though this passage refers to only confusion. Yeah. Yeah. And there is the question, and you put that in the middle of the tribulation. Uh, and a lot of it depends on how do you translate or, or, or interpret the book of Revelation. Uh, a lot of people will take the book of Revelation and they mix and match. And, and, and to some extent it is mixed and matched. Uh, but as far as the revealing of the prophecies go, I'm always a literalist, and I take it in chronological order that God, when he was revealing this to John, didn't go, okay, you know what, I'm going to show you something that happens in 2,135 years. Oh, now it's 2,130 years. Okay, this one's 2,133. You know, I think God is revealing to John in sequential order, and that for the most part, that's how the book of Revelation is. But Now, we do have some things that are stuck in there. Uh, Revelation 12 is stuck in there. But even that, what happens in Revelation 12, part of it, is in sequential order. And you'll see that as we go along. But it depends on how you're going to interpret the Scripture. How you're going to, you know, because there, there are a lot of people who will say that the seals, the trumpets, and the bowl judgments are the first seal, the first trumpet, and the first bowl judgment all happen at the same time. And then the next seal, next trumpet, next bowl, all happen at the same time. Whereas I believe seal one happens, two, three, four, five, six, seventh seal opens the seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven trumpet opens the seven vial judgments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we have the end, which is, that's the chronological order. People who look at it as a, a mid-trib mid rapture have to mean have to take that those seals somehow happened before Revelation 4.1. So the stuff in chapter 6 has to come before 4 and after 3. 
It, to me, it doesn't make sense. But I'm not going to, I can't prove it. So I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. It's just my opinion. And this is what I was saying earlier, and then we've got to close it down. This is what I was saying earlier. All of us, if you study the Word of God and you teach the Word of God, are false teachers. Okay? Because we see through a glass dimly. And that must that is harsh because we like to toss that term around false teacher so quickly, especially those of us, you know, who are in the clergy, you know, when we do it, especially in apologetics, we like to call people false teachers. But guess what? So are you. Now it may be a very, very minor doctrine, and theirs may be very major, but we need to have a bit of humility to understand that, you know what? It might be in the midpoint. And if I get on my high horse and be dogmatic like I was 20 years ago, there ain't no way, you know, and I'm wrong, I'm an unhumble false teacher. And that's just not a good thing. That's no way. Exactly. All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the intricate design that is your word and how beautifully it's crafted and woven together and that, Lord, you have done it uh, You've hidden this. You've made it a mystery. But, Father, Father I thank you for uh, how you have revealed things through your Scripture and through your Spirit. Father, help us to take these lessons and just use them and just to, to build each other up, Father. Lord, bless us now in Christ's name. Amen.